So hello, Chris and I are here with Barb Whalen uh, doing a recorded session where Barb's going to talk to us about a very unique style of weaving that was very common with uh, 18th, 19th century uh, military sashes. So uh, Barb's a, a good friend of ours and, and we're thrilled to feature her on this talk and, and share it with our audience. So a little background on Barb. She's a Textile artist now living in Eastern Ontario. She learned to weave in 1988 while serving as a medical officer with the Canadian military in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. When she left Nova Scotia for Ontario in 1989, the, the demands of being a mother to two small children and managing her medical practice left little time for textiles, so she donated everything to a beginning weaver. Ten years ago, when her children were nearly grown and having focused her professional work on medical psychotherapy, she picked up her weaving interest where she left off and hasn't stopped learning since. In 2017, having been exposed to finger weaving and spraying in her concurrent hobby of historical reenacting, she traveled to Winnipeg to spend a weekend with Carol James, textile artist, to learn finger weaving and spraying, and in May 2022, she took early retirement to pursue her interests in weaving and textiles. Having a particular interest in historic textiles, she was approached by reenactors to recreate the sprang woven sashes worn by military officers and sergeants in the 18th and 19th century, a challenge which she readily accepted and which has introduced her to the very deep rabbit hole of the fascinating textile world of spraying. And unfortunately, Barb's cost both Chris and I money as we enjoy <laughs> her creation. So uh, with that introduction, Barb, I'm going to mute my microphone and, and turn this over to you. So carry on. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you uh, to both of you for inviting me to speak today. It is such a pleasure to be able to tell you something about spraying. Um, it's uh, taken up a good deal of my time in the last couple of years, but I thoroughly enjoy it. So I've entitled this Sprang, what is it, where did it come from, and why have I never heard of it before? So I'm going to start just with a little bit of background. Um, this is a painting from oh, 150 years ago that um, shows a woman who's actually doing Sprang. It's rare to see artistic renditions of Sprang, but um, there are a few of them about. So I just wanted to include this one in this talk today. So what is Sprang? So it's actually in the dictionary. So Sprang is a weaving technique which, uh, in which threads or cords are intertwined and twisted over one another to form an open work mesh. So fundamentally, Sprang is a textile making process where these threads are stretched vertically on a frame and twisted and or crossed at the center. This central manipulation is then translated both up and down the frame, resulting in the creation of new cloth at both ends. And it dates back to about 3,500 years ago. Um, and it has been used, uh, was used extensively um, in the intervening 3,500 years. So there are three basic sprang structures. Um, the one that you spoke about, Tom, in the military sashes is interlinking. And that's, that's the beginning of the first sash that I made. And in that, you can see the um, center line here from which it all begins. And you can probably see where the, the, each thread is twisted around its neighbor, which is one of the hallmarks of interlinking sprang. Um, interlacing is also spraying, and this technique doesn't actually involve twisting. It's it's more um, more typical of a classical braid. Uh, if you think about hair braiding, in which three strands are crossed, but they're crossed so that they're not twisted. They're just crossed across each other. Um, and intertwining, um, in which one and this one is used often with color, where one strand is. Um, taken either in front of or behind its neighbor to create lines. And so you might be able to tell from these three photos where in interlinking the structures, um, each thread carries almost an up and down orientation, whereas in interlacing it's diagonal and in intertwining it's diagonal. So what about spraying? 
um, I've got a frame here to show you a little bit, and I'll talk about this as we go through it. So spraying is a finger manipulated weaving technique that is described as braiding or plating on, stretch, on stretched threads. It is comprised exclusively of warp or lengthwise threads. In the world of weaving, we talk about warp and weft, where warp is the longitudinal threads and weft are the crosswise threads. In spraying, there are no, there's no weft. It's all um, longitudinal, which is a little different from finger weaving in that um, in finger weaving, each of the uh, warp threads becomes weft as it gets to the edge or um, at some intervening point. Whereas in spraying, that never happens. And in fact, many claim it's not, in fact, many um, purists would claim that it's not a weave structure at all because there is no weft. Um, and they would say that it's, it's plating or braiding. In its construction, spraying always includes, and I'll put this in front of the camera, a center starting line. And you could see that in that small picture of the sash that I'd started. This is where the weaving happens in this center line. Um, and from the center line, Barb, the weaving happens. I, yes. I wonder, can you stop sharing for a moment? And, and that way that will be far more visible. So, because when you're, you're sure. demonstrating to a camera, it's just on that little postage stamp. Yep. Can you see now? Yeah, much better. Okay. Yeah, the... Okay, I'm gonna... <laughs> problem is my camera's on the other monitor so it looks like I'm looking sideways so I'm just gonna hopefully yes so let me know when you're ready to go again no that's good all right thank you okay so this is the center starting line and one of the other hallmarks of spraying I'm just gonna lower this a little bit yeah, that's still on the camera so I'm gonna leave weave one row of spraying hopefully not dropping the frame just to give you a very brief overview of how this happens. So in spraying, um, the weaving happens at the center or close to the center. And all I'm doing is manipulating the longitudinal threads around each other, such that I create a new row. That's one row. And then what happens as, as I push this new row of um, weaving down, you might be able to see that a new row of weaving has collected at the bottom, right there. I'm gonna preserve that with my chopstick and taking this one out, putting it below the new row. And I'm now translating this new row of weaving up. So now what I've done is I've, uh, by me weaving one row at the center, I have now created two rows of weaving. And if you're curious about these beads, I almost always use beads on the outermost threads because typically what will happen is at the end of the project, I'll remove those threads. And those beads allow me to always keep those threads on the outside because it's very easy to get them confused and to, to travel inwards. So that's that's why they exist. So I'm going to go back to screen sharing. As you're doing that, that's a spraying sash we can see in the background. That is, in fact, that's the, the latest one that I've started. And it's um, about 20 inches in. So um, now that you know all about how to make sprang, um, and I've said here that the plating happens at the side of the crossed warp threads, and then the manipulation goes up and down, that, that recreates the, the same weaving at the top and the bottom. And because of this, at the end of the project, whether it's um, um, a very long sash or a very short project, like the one I showed you on the frame, we need to stabilize the ends. Because much like a hair braid, if you take out those chopsticks in this case, um, without stabilizing them in some way, it'll all just come undone. So that's one of the ways in which you can look historically at a um, piece of fabric and know whether it was made with spraying as if there's um, 
stabilizing of the ends in some way. So where does this word come from? Uh, I actually went to Google Translate to find out how to say sprangning, but I think that's how you say it. So sprangning is an old Swedish word, originally meaning any open work textile. And because sprang is or was a living textile art up until at least the 19th century, in Sweden they have um, they still have conjugations of sprang and different uses of the word other than just um, in English all we have is sprang. So there was no such thing as spranging because sprang, spranging is not a verb. So sprang just describes the um, the, the process. Um, although in in Sweden and in Finland both of those have maintained the um, sprang art um, through up until at least the 19th century and, and and of course now although there may have been a break in the middle there in the 20th century. So both of those countries have extensive words for this process, but in English we don't. However, historically there are many other words to describe this process. Twine plating, knotless netting, open work fabric, Egyptian plating, Coptic plating, and twining. Um, other terms might actually more accurately represent it. Frame plating, loom braiding, stretched thread interworking, but this starts to get unwieldy. And then um, other words to describe it are still in use in Holland and in Germany and in Sweden. And I've referenced Peter Collingwood's book. And I'm just gonna show you it into the camera. This book, The Techniques of Sprang, was written by a very famous weaver, uh, Peter Collingwood. And it is probably the most commonly used book to learn sprang, uh, with a pop possible exception now of Carol James's book, but that's fairly recent. So even more confusing when we're trying to look historically about um, whether textiles are made from sprang. Um, Beatrix Nutz is a, an archaeological textile researcher and publisher. So in her, um, I think it's 2009 article um, entitled Linen Sprang from Langberg Castle, she's talking about Peter Collingwood's lists and recognizing that he did not reference anything from the 15th century and she was curious about that does that mean they didn't exist and she says probably not it's just because they used so many different words to describe this process it's hard to um, narrow down what was actually sprang so for instance the word stricken may have been used which is the word for knitting um, by the 20th century the spraying techniques were all but forgotten in most Central European countries. And so anything that was actually spraying was probably called something else, which may account for why um, there's so little historic reference to this. But I'm going to um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the archaeological findings. So when was spraying first created? And this is just a, um, a photo of some miser's purses that I made. So the oldest known spraying artifacts date back to 1400 BC. Um, one of them was found um, in 1871 in Denmark. Uh, um, the second one uh, also found in a different place, also in Denmark. Found in 1935. And then more forward from that, 1100 BCE cylindrical bags and fabrics found in Peru in 1957 that were made of interlinking and interlacing. 800 to 500 BCE, a hairnet discovered in 1835, but not recognized as sprang until a century later. And one of the ways that it's recognized was that an error was found in one of these hairnets. And when you think about that, and, and the error was then reproduced across the center line. So if you're looking at most textile productions, if you make an error, you don't go out of your way to reproduce that error on the other side. So they were looking for a, um, a textile um, art that would do that. And that's when Sprang was rediscovered because they, they recognized that um, this is about the only textile reproduction that would do that. Um, so again, in Peru, 500 to 300 BC, 
and then uh, neck coverings from Peru with very elaborate and sometimes with elaborate double and sometimes quadruple intertwined sprang. And then more recently, woolen stockings from Sweden. Um, and then in Egypt, in um, Coptic is um, another word for Egyptian Christians, where there's a lot of sprang for eight, uh, 400 to 700 AD Coptic sprang fabrics discovered from the 1880s in Upper Egypt, made from linen or wool. Some are pointed and called caps, and some are rectangular with drawstrings and called bags. Also found turbans and other garments. Techniques include hole designs, which I call lace, ZNS twist, um, extra twining threads. Uh, but you can see um, 1500 years ago that their techniques and their skill was highly developed. AD 850, a wooden frame found in a ship may have been a sprang frame. Um, 1300 to 1500 AD, a shirt was found in Arizona. And I'm going to show you a photo of that in just a minute. Again, in 15th century, a white linen fabric, probably a tablecloth that was made on a circular warp, complex lace designs. Um, 17th century, three women's caps of silk and gold thread, silk mittens. So lots and lots of extant sprang. This is uh, a picture of one of those um, wool bonnets from Egypt. And this is using the intertwining technique with these um, diagonal crossed intertwined um, threads, which is now in Brussels. So Carol James, who is a current Sprang artist, reproduced that shirt that was found in Arizona. So this is Carol's reproduction of that Sprang shirt. Uh, highly technical, lots of lace. So to get forward to um, what you mentioned, Tom, in the introduction was the military sashes. So ceremonial sashes were made of silk and worn by army officers, each country having its own colored striping, usually simple interlinking, sometimes with lace, um, but often not, up to 12 feet long and up to 30 inches wide. Also used by officers of town guilds. And um, so I'm just carrying on with the history. Still existing also are many unfinished, about 100 pieces, many of are unfinished, um, made by a woman in Bruges that are now in the um, Royal Museum of Art in Brussels. And again, many pieces survive uh, from about 1850, made by a textile artist in Germany. So this is an example of a military sash. Um, this is the sash, well, one of the sashes that is in the um, Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And you can see the complex lace designs or hole designs. You can also see the center line here um, from which it's reciprocated from one side to the other. So more recently in Langberg Castle, um, is a, there was an archaeological investigation that has found more sprang that's dating back to the 15th century, including three undyed linen sprang fabrics. Initially, when these were discovered, they were thought to be a women's bra, but when they actually tried to reconstruct them and use them for that purpose, they it didn't work so they determined that it must be headdresses and in fact there are illustrations of that time period where women and men are depicted wearing similar head coverings this is that um, tablecloth that is in switzerland that um, is from the 15th century still in the national museum in zurich and you can see just how skilled the artist was that that made this piece of um, textile Another um, sprang extant fabric from um, the 1450 to 1500 in the UK, which is now held in New York. There've also been um, noted to be patterns that are similar to the headdress that was found in Langberg um, and are felt to be, or thought to be uh, similar to those in the earliest known um, pattern book from 1536. Um, but the patterns that are used for embroidery could also be used for sprang too because they are basically holes that are built on a grid. And so few of these exist, um, mostly because textiles deteriorate over time. However, this 
um, the history prior to the 18th century was unknown to most people. And in 1871, this hairnet was discovered in, in Denmark and a, a Danish student discovered it and um, looked at it carefully and noticed the two small mistakes. So she actually reproduced that. I took it to the World Fair of 1889, which is about when this, the, the rebirth of Sprang has come about. And about the same time, archaeologists ar working in Egypt were discovering bags and caps made of wool and linen in this strange technique. So a merchant took some to Austria where they were um, thought to be made with linking, uh, but they couldn't be reproduced during linking, nor did the central meeting line make any sense. But Louise Schinnerer was a Viennese embroidery teacher, was researching Ukrainian textiles and coincidentally discovered Sprang as a living craft in Ukrainian villages. She learned it on the spot and published her findings in 1895. So our modern awareness of Sprang is, um, dates back to this very narrow time period um, in the late 1800s. But, um, because of things like the internet, we now know that tradition, there are lots of places where the tradition hasn't been broken. And at the time of the second publication of Colling, Collingwood's book, um, Sprang had been recorded in all of these countries. But as Collingwood says, with very few exceptions, it only persists at a technical level far below that which was present in the earliest finds in Denmark, Egypt, and Peru. So let's talk about sashes a little bit. Um, military sashes from the 18th and 19th centuries were very commonly made using the spraying technique. So this is the Braddock sash and you can't really tell in this photo, but the words or the numerals 1709 are actually woven into the sash. Um, this sash features five major designs or motifs that if it was spread out, you could actually see them. And they, um, they identify them as this six inch field of diamond diaper. A diaper is a weaving word for just a reproductive pattern. Three and a half inch band uh, consisting of eight rows of circles flanking an open work field displaying the year 1709. Eight and a quarter inch row of 10 hat wearing men nine inches of five offset rows of outward facing triangles and a five and 13 16 inch field of small diamonds and then rows of two four or six petal flowers separating the five designs and then this 12 and a half inch knotted tassels woven into each end so this sash is about um, well, 130 inches by 19 inches it's a big sash and that just talks a little bit more about the sash Tradition maintains that Braddock presented the sash to Washington prior to his death. And um, in 1846, the sash was presented to another war hero. And this sash now lives at Mount Vernon. And there it is uh, on display at Mount Vernon. Most of the time, the original sash is um, not out for viewing, but Carol James has reproduced this sash and her sash is available to, for viewing at Mount Vernon. This is a sash in the Swedish Army Museum, and you can tell um, that it's made using the Sprang technique by looking um, at these areas. And again, the, 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 um, the ends are protected, not by using, um, these are added threads at this end. They're not made exclusively by using the um, warp, but more threads have been added and it's been secured with these tassels. So if you're in southwestern Ontario, you actually can go to see some original sashes. These three are at Lundy's Lane. And I just want to draw your attention to a few things about these sashes. Uh, firstly, they're not all the same color. They're close, but um, they're not identical. Two of the three have these buttonholes. Now, I don't know if they're actually used as buttonholes, but I don't know that we really know what they were used for. Um, so we call them buttonholes. The other thing that you'll notice is that um, as it as we're nearing the end, these um, stitches nearing the end are doubled. So each of the warp ends is is then paired with its neighbor and they're woven as one set. 
And then when you get even closer, they're actually quadrupled down here. So that allows the, the width of the sash to be narrowed in. And then right here at the end, you might be able to tell that um, these bumps are a little bit thicker. That's because weft has been added. That's to secure this, um, the ends of the warp before you cut it off. And then the ends are all twisted into these fringes. So they're all made with pretty much the same technique with a few minor interferences, um, like plus or minus a buttonhole, and you might have a longer or shorter part of um, doubles or quadruples. This, um, because I dye my own silk most of the time, I took a ball of my silk <laughs> to Lundy's Lane to check it out with the originals, and I thought I'd done a pretty good job matching it. And this is me again measuring looking at the center line here and trying to um, approximate the number of rows per inch that they were um, using. This is a sash that's in Buffalo at their um, history museum. And you can see this one online too. There's an article entitled um, Inside the Conservator Studio, where they document how they, they um, repaired some of this sash. So again, um, that's the same sash that um, when it was um, brought out for me to have a look at. And this is at the War Museum in Ottawa. And this, as the sash is pulled out, you can see um, what they've called, they, they're usually identified as hole designs. Uh, I call them lace. Um, I guess it's just a different tradition. In weaving, we call them lace, but in spraying, they typically call them hole designs. And this tag reads Major George Bond. And here's a second one at the War Museum. You can see this one doesn't have holes or doesn't have lace. It's straightforward interlinking. And this uh, more pictures of that um, sash at the ROM, where you can see um, the reciprocal designs. And you can see too that most of the extant um, sashes have the, the motifs are primarily geometric, whether they're diamonds or triangles or chevrons, um, likely because that's what's most straightforward to reproduce in the, the grid that we're working with. There are very few wool sashes that remain, but there are a few at Edinburgh Castle. I have not seen them, but um, I know people that have. Um, particularly these four. And so I was given the task of reproducing one of them. And this particular one has a rosette that I had to <laughs> figure out how to make. And I think I've done a pretty close job based on the photo that was sent to me, um, including with colors. So the colors that you'll see here um, are not typically what we see in a, um, a red coat, because it's actually not red, it's a much rustier color and um, probably because it was dyed with matter which tends to give an orange rusty color and there's that sash being worn with the rosette here a couple other worsted sashes that I've made and then you can see that both of these have the buttonholes and the narrowing where the ends are doubled or quadrupled so other Regency spraying. Um, I bring up Nelson's purse because that's a fairly new discovery. I think it was 2002 where this miser's purse was discovered um, at the home of the um, relatives of Alexander Davison, to whom um, much of Admiral Nelson's personal um, belongings went to when he was killed, and they were just stashed away. And so they weren't, <laughs> that trunk wasn't opened up until 2002, um, at which time it was sold at auction for £270,000. Um, Apparently this purse, when it was discovered, still had Nelson's blood on it. And then, so Martin Downer was the um, reporter um, who's written a book about this discovery. This is a sprang purse in Williamsburg that I really want to recreate. So I've got to, <laughs> I've got to look more closely at this and uh, uh, unpack how that was done. This is just some information about it. 
And I expect this was secured. I think this is probably done on a flat warp rather than a um, circular one. It was secured at this end. And there may have been two of them made at a time and just um, uh, cut at the center. That's a close up of it. So how does one make Sprang? So this, this is from Carol James's website um, with whom I'm in fairly um, common communication. Um, and she's, she's said, yes, please go ahead. Please tell the whole world about Sprang. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my attempt to tell the whole world about Sprang. So this photo is from her website. And the basic maneuver, as I showed you on the, my little frame here, was um, on one row, you'll bring two edge threads forward and then push one back. And then aside from the edge, every subsequent stitch, you bring one forward, one back, one forward, one back. And then when this row is done, you'll start again over at this side. And the second row, you'll it's, it's just one forward, one back. So it's, and that's how um, cloth is made. So the first event, um, when I start out a, a sash or any kind of a project, I make the initial row where everything is just, I just bring one forward, one back, and I, I basically um, make a crisscrossing at the center line. Next is this plating row where I start with this three edge or three stitch edge um, stitch. And then the third row um, is called an over plate row and it secures the plate row. And it's the reverse of this. And then it's over and over and over again in plain interlinking. Cloth is made using longitudinal threads stretched on a frame. Um, these threads are called the warp. Um, on a flat warp, um, you'll see that they're secured on both ends of the frame. In a circular warp, um, and you can see on the big frame behind me, maybe, that I guess you can see the bottom. It's not attached there, but it goes underneath the, um, the bottom and it goes over the top. So it's one continuous loop. So those are the two kinds of warps that one might be using with spraying is either a flat warp or um, a circular warp. More pictures of this. So this is a, probably a better picture of a circular warp. You can see that it goes over the top and then around the bottom. And then here you can see this again. And this, um, this is made such that the, this and this are six feet apart. Now I have made sashes that I needed more than six feet of length. So I've added this little extension at the top. So when I um, start th those sashes, this um, PVC tube actually has to go up and go through here. And then as when you weave, the ends get closer together because there's what's called um, take up here. And so I'll then take this um, dowel and the PVC pipe out of the top and then bring it back here. And then the, the top and the bottom will move and approximate each other. So just I'm just going to walk through the making of a silk sash. Um, when I get silk, I get it from Colorado, and it has to be real silk. Spun silk just doesn't have the integrity that's needed, so it looks like this. It comes in a in a skein of undyed silk. So I dyed in my kitchen, and you can see one, two, three, six skeins of silk. Got that starting line again. So this um, again shows up on around the top, the starting lane line, which is never as straight across as I'd like it to be. And then is a, just a, a wider view of that same process. The making of the buttonhole, and you can see that you're starting to get, um, I call them bumpier areas. And this actually, this picture shows, um, this purple thread is what I call a safety thread. Um, again, this white thread is a safety thread. When you're doing spraying, you, um, you're very brave if you don't have safety strings because it's so easy to make an error. And if you don't have a fail safe to which you can return to, um, to a row that you 
know or you're fairly sure there are no mistakes in, then um, you'll you'll lose hours and hours and hours of trying to um, correct it. This is the really scary part <laughs> where I'm cutting the whole thing apart. So this is now all woven and now I'm cutting across. It will be somewhere up here. So there's one laying on the floor. And you can see these two ends up here used to be connected. Um, and now they're unattached. Twisting the fringe and each one has to be grouped into groups of however many make it look proper and I usually end up with six um, of these threads threads in one fringe. Um, this is another really scary part for me is putting it in the bathtub because I've just spent months usually making a sash and then just to put it in soap and water doesn't doesn't seem to be the right thing to do but it's one of those necessary things it has to be done because spraying when it comes off the frame because it's mostly twisting is very corkscrewy and in this wet finishing it um, that's when it flattens out so even though I kind of grit my teeth it, it's part of the process and there's a completed spraying sash ready to go to its new home so just a little about spraying um, in the 21st century. Well, I guess this is the 20th. But in 1974, the um, the owners of the Lacey Museum in California um, sponsored um, a spraying installation in, in um, San Francisco. And they used 35 miles of quarter inch sisal rope, making spraying panels up to 120 feet long and weighing over 800 pounds for fabricated and then joined to form a landscape in and around the lower five floors of this building, the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. And it was it was hosted at the time to coincide with the biennial conference ho hosted by the Hand Weavers Guild of America in San Francisco. There are a lot of people doing Sprang in um, 2024. Um, I'm part of a Facebook group that has more than 3,300 members, and there's some very skilled people. Um, I just put a few websites up. Um, Carol James, who is actively teaching. Um, Carol has met Silva in Prague. Um, Edith Musner is um, um, a textile artist who does outdoor installations. And um, these other people are current Sprang artists who are actively teaching and researching and um, creating Sprang art. So how does one learn? Um, I was so grateful to spend a weekend with Carol because I have one on one attention, which is a real gift. Her book, um, which I keep very near and dear to me, is really, really helpful. Peter's book, Peter Collingwood's book, is also really helpful, but he has he doesn't have the pictures that Carol does. So I highly recommend Carol's book. Um, Peter Collingwood's book, um, I also highly recommend, but it's been very difficult to get until very recently that it's now available as an ebook. And just a few of the sources that I have um, cited in this talk. So I really appreciate you taking a moment to uh, to listen to this information about Sprang. I'd like to just say thank you to Carol for teaching me Sprang and being there as a constant source of wisdom and encouragement. Um, thanks to Glendon for first bringing this up to me in 2009 in Sackets Harbor saying, can you do Sprang? And I said, no, not a chance. And then to you, Chris, for that Longwoods meeting <laughs> that was ever so uh, fateful in 2017 when I showed you that tiny little scarf and you said, can you make me a sash? So thank you. I didn't think I could, but it seems I can. So if you've got any questions, I'm happy to um, do my best to answer them. Why don't you stop, don't sharing? stop sharing? Okay. Perfect. Um, how many sashes have you done now, Barb? I'm just going to bring you over here so I can see you. I have done, um, this is the very first one that I made as a prototype. That's the one that you had, Chris, for a bit. Um, I've done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
silk sashes and I've done six worsted sashes um, and I've got two more silk sashes on the go. Well, that's uh, considering how long it takes you because what, what's your practice? Like, like you don't sit there spranging all, all day long, right? You, you limit yourself to a certain amount of time or... I do. I'm getting better, shockingly, <laughs> because <laughs> when I was first uh, learning Sprang, I I committed to four rows a day, and I was frequently making errors that I then and sometimes I wouldn't notice them until I was eight rows beyond, and then I had to unweave, find the error, correct it, and then carry on. Um, there's eight rows, eight to ten rows in an inch, so four rows a day. I was going half an inch a day. And when you're looking at a sash that's at least seven feet long and sometimes 10 feet long, um, I think the longest one I've made is 130 inches long. So when you're doing half an inch a day, it takes a while. So I can do, I can do eight to 12 inches a day now, but after that, especially with silk, because it's so fine, the worsted is thicker, so it, it packs in quicker. Um, and I'm working sort of at shoulder height, so it, it can get tiring. So I have to limit it to um, both my attention span as well as the, my physical body to how much time I can spend doing it. And there's, I'm intervening where Chris usually is. Normally he has all these <laughs> questions and I'm firing away first, getting mine off my chest. So um and then the, the historical examples or what have you, that there's no mechanical means of doing this, that this is painstaking finger weaving that is the only way? Yes. There are vague references to, references to a spranging machine that was allegedly two stories high. I think that's, um, I don't think it ever existed. Um, it certainly doesn't exist now. And... I believe that is only done manually. And and Carol tells me um, that um, in conversation with she's had with European researchers that the worsted sashes that are worn by sergeants were made by the soldiers themselves. Wow. Mm hmm. It's not once you've got the mechanics of starting it the the repetitive maneuvers that you do row after row after row after row are very straightforward it's the starting and stopping that's tricky or if you're doing lace then getting the pattern in is tricky but the actual um eight to ten feet of lace may or of interlinking um is is very repetitive so i can see if you had somebody could set it up and then finish it off how that could be done yeah, somehow I think a sergeant would make his make his men do it for him or something. <laughs> Probably why they knew it. Was every time they were sergeants. Then. Instead, instead of going out looking for a pub, you guys sit here and <laughs> do this. Um, other other famous ones. I, I seem to recall. I think there's a couple at the National Army Museum in London. I, I remember Sir John Moore's sashes there. Um, was there another one there too, Chris? Do you recall or? I don't, re I'm just when you mentioned the museum, I do remember seeing John Moore's. Um, I, I'm fairly confident in saying there's a extent of, of Wallington sash somewhere, but um, I couldn't say where that would be. Yeah, and I think there's one in the museum at Fort Meg. So when I'm there in May, I'll, I'll have another look for it again. So there, there is one in Amherstburg. Um, Elliot's sash is there Colonel Elliot? Probably um, his uniform code is there, so yeah, yeah. So that's in Amherstbury. There's also one at Willoughby Museum, um, outside, um, Queenston. Queenston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a sash there. Now, I'm, I'm told Carol tells me that I must go to the military museum in Brussels when I'm there because she says that when you first go into the museum, the entire floor um is filled with uniforms and sprang sashes that is uh a, an old school museum they just everything <laughs> they have they they have it on display they just, 
examine more and more stuff and it's, it's quite remarkable so yeah apparently they have lots of sashes i should mention um a couple of things so um on carol james's website she has a free download of um um the patterns inspired by dutch sashes and but she has painstakingly gone through all of these um and decoded all of the motifs so she has made this book available for purchase for anybody anybody who wants to recreate a, a lace a spring sash with lace in it well i'm i'm glad i know a skilled artisan that can make one for me i don't have to try to do it myself <laughs> All right, Chris, I'll let, I'll let you go. <laughs> so. Well, this is a nice segue, Barb, because I, I think I have a, uh, a passing understanding now of how the, um, the basic interweaving, the intertwining works. But how, what is the technique for getting the patterns or even the holes? Is that just a matter of sort of um, putting two threads around on each side and, and leaving it in the... How would you get the lace? How would you make that? So, um, so yes. So what happens um, for something like this? So basically I showed you at the edge, um, both the right side and the left side, the extreme right hand and left side of a sash, you use three, th three threads to make the edge stitch. So what happens when you're making holes, you, you end it in the center. So you make a left edge stitch and then you, you pick up right away with a right edge stitch. So you end up with a gap basically. And that's, so that's done in the plate row. And then you'll do that um, to make the hole um, for as many times as you, you need holes. Um, and then the next row is just done contiguously. Like the, the over plate row is always just over, under, over, under. There's no lacing happening in the, most of the time I should say. Um, most of the work is done in the braiding row or the plate row. But the other thing that's also done um, in the, um, the motifs, what you'll often see is this background. I guess I can show you this. This is a reproduction of that hairnet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this um, is interlinking that's done all with double stitches. So I've done every stitch here is done using two. So you end up, if you start out, um, with single stitches and then you start using them as doubled and then in, in the, the second subsequent row you double them the opposite way so you're using the neighbor stitch you end up with this this grid so in order to make a motif essentially what I'm doing is creating a grid and then somewhere in the, the this network I'm then superimposing whatever the motif is whether it's a um, a two-headed chicken or <laughs> whatever it is from uh, the um, um, that that is desired in that so it's the plain interlinking stitch that then gets reproduced or recreated in a background of double stitches fascinating and i suppose that's really that's your only method of of changing up the, because there's no uh weft thread it's no. it's literally just how many threads you're gathering is or which direction or when you're starting and stopping is really the only so you process can... you have to work with. Now you can. Um, there are there are a number of things you can do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the one that was on the frame that I showed you. This is the the mechanism like that was used in the Coptic. So this is intertwining. So if you add color, you can do a lot with color, but, um, and occasionally you can find lace and color in the same piece, but it's often one or the other. You'll see color or you'll see lace, but often you won't see both. Um, but when you're using all one color, you don't have a lot to work with. You can, the other thing you can do is, is not intertwine um, a thread with its neighbor so you end up with something that gets unwoven so you just end up with what looks like a rope or um, like a single thread that is um, an orphan thread so that's another um, tool you have to work with fascinating and I'm wondering can you compare and contrast 
working with silk. Now, I guess I should start. You've worked, you've worked with um, worsted wool and silk. Have you done anything else, like a linen or a cotton? Well, um, you mentioned them in extent garments, but. Yes, I have used linen. I should have got this. I'll do one second. Linen is lovely. So this is linen and it is, um, linen is a little stiffer. So I find it much easier to, to work with. Now in this piece, you can see, well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I've secured the center piece here with fishing line. So it's almost invisible, but it still has to be secured. Otherwise you lose everything. So linen um, is lovely to work with. This, This is 3-2 cotton, um, and it too is, is quite, quite enjoyable to work with. And there's my center line. Where's my center line? Yes, there's my center line. So that's 3-2. This is 5-2 cotton. So again, um, I haven't found anything that I didn't like working with. When I first learned, I used um, slippery kind of acrylic yarns that were um, that were nice to work with in the beginning because they were big and they slid over each other. I, I think I'd find that annoying now, but they were very useful in the beginning. So I was just wondering, kind of following up on that, if you, you could compare and contrast silk versus worsted. Like is one easier, worsted would be I think you mentioned chunkier. Is that make it more difficult, or does is the silk more difficult because it's so fine? They're different. Um, so yes, worsted is thicker, but worsted, <clears throat> excuse me, worsted has um, because of the way worsted wool comes off the animal and then is spun into yarn, it has. Um, little fluffy pieces of wool that um, if you use friction against it, fall off. And so because the way spraying is made, when I have to separate the two, um, the front and the back threads with every row, when I'm using worsted yarn, that's a very difficult process because they stick together. It's sticky yarn. So I have to separate, and, and if you can see that sash, it's over about 14 feet <laughs> with every row. So I have to pull apart these the front and the back um, layers of weaving up the top and down the bottom. And so the, the wool actually gets a little thinner as I'm using it. Um, so one of the that's one of the difficult things about worsted, but one of the nice things about it, it's it's a much thicker yarn, so it accumulates more quickly. Silk, silk is just so elegant to work with. I love working with silk and it separates much more easily, but it's also tiny. It's, um, um, again, it's, it's probably eight to 10 rows an inch, whereas worsted's more like five or six. Um, I prefer working with silk just because it's just so um, the the texture of it it just feels so good with because I'm 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 finger manipulating so much of it that it's it's very nice to work with. I've never had a silk thread break on me. I've never had a wool thread break on me, but I've come close just because the wool has become so thinned with all of the fluffiness that's come off of the yarn as I've manipulated it. Fascinating, thank you. And then um, maybe just um, to sort of close, I guess, or look to the future, um, is are there things that you, I know you said you had two silk sashes on the go. Is there something that you really want to work towards? Something that you really want to, um, what are your goals for the future, I guess, with spraying? <laughs> uh, well, one of it is um, awareness. Like 
I, um, the more people that can learn Sprang, and I, I, I really appreciate traditional craft, and the more people who come to know Sprang, I think then the more likely it is that we can then re-enliven this skill that, you know, 3,000 years ago in Peru, they were experts at, and we might have a dozen people in the world now who are skilled to that degree. So um, I think there are a lot of people now who are beginning Sprang artists. There's um, maybe 50 who are very skilled, and then there's there's maybe, like I say, a dozen who are highly, highly skilled. And I just think the bigger we make that population, the more this skill is going to be known. Yeah, that's fair. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to turn it back to Tom, but uh, just this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Chris, truly. <laughs> You're muted, Tom. There we go. Uh, hopefully we can do our part to help uh, spread the word on Sprang and, and develop interest in it. Um, do you do any workshops or teaching yourself? Or I have not. I've not felt confident um, until very recently in in the detection of errors and how to um, fix an error. I, I haven't felt confident enough to teach. I think I'm getting close. The other challenge is um, spraying frames. They are they're not they're not difficult to make. And if I was a woodworker, I'm sure I could whip them up in two hours. I'm not a woodworker. Um, so if I was going to teach, I'd have to have a, um, an available source. Now, I know how to make them, and I could make them. It's just not something that I really want to spend a week doing is making <laughs> spraying frames. But I can see that it might come to that. Um, so I, I can see that it's um, on my radar. The other thing that I can say is I've just committed to buying two kilograms of silk. So... <laughs> That's a lot of silk. So I expect I'm going to be doing this for a while. Awesome. We look forward mm -hmm. to seeing your handiwork. So thank <laughs> you so much, Barb. Oh, you're so welcome. And then a lot of the, the links and stuff you had in your presentation, I'll make sure they're um, in the description for the video on the YouTube channel as well. So Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Our pleasure.